Hi, everyone. I'm so delighted to be introducing our next speaker. Our next speaker is Julia Engwin. She is the founder and editor at large of the markup. Org. If you're not subscribed to that newsletter, what are you doing? I will take credit as being on the first like thousand subscribers of this newsletter. I saw Subway ads for it, and I was like, tech watchdog journalism sounds great. I gotta get get on this, um, and I'm so 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 delighted to be welcoming Julia as our speaker today. Julia is a former writer at Wall Street Journal, ProPublica. She has a BA in math from Chicago. She got an MBA right here at Columbia. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, and she was nominated to, as a finalist two other times. She's a total boss. Please welcome Julia Angwin. Thank you. Um, let's see. Ah, OK. It's great to be here. Thank you all. I decided to do no slides because I thought um, I had more chance of keeping you all awake in that terrifying pre-lunch moment. <laughs> so I'm going to try to be amusing. Um, I um, love being here. I am um, I live a few blocks away and went to Columbia. My daughter is starting at Barnard in the fall. And um, uh, my husband is an engineer. So I'm a fully engineering Columbia kind of family. And I thought what I would do is talk about the thing you guys are all here to talk about, which is impact and how to have impact because I've had a journey of my own that I think kind of demonstrates ways to get impact. And so I'm going to talk about growing up in Palo Alto and my journey from thinking I would be a technologist to becoming a journalist and the evolution of how I've done journalism. And so um, I want to leave a lot of time for questions. So I'm going to talk about all that and then leave time. And um, Alan is going to come around with questions. So get them ready. I want a lot of them. Um, so I'm just going to start with a little bit of who I am, where I came from. I grew up in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto in the 70s and 80s. So it was before the current Silicon Valley, everyone's a millionaire. At that time, everyone worked at Stanford University and were professors, right? So it was very much a college town. But my parents were uniquely interested in the personal computer revolution that was going on at that time. And so we only had um, the early Apple II at home. We had um, all the early computers. My parents both worked in software. And I learned to program in fifth grade because Steve Jobs, who lived in Palo Alto, was doing a program where he wanted all the students to learn programming. So he paid for the schools to teach it. So it was very early. And sometimes I get a little mad that everyone talks about today's um, youth as digital natives because I'm like, no, I also <laughs> would like that credibility. Um, and so I really actually didn't, I had such a narrow worldview that I really thought there were two job paths in life, software and hardware. And I was just like, which one do I want? You know, actually, I was totally clear that I was software. And I think if all of you know, it's a, it's still kind of like that. <laughs> like, um, and so I was always a software partisan. Um, great respect for hardware. But <laughs> um, so I went off to University of Chicago to study math because at that time they didn't actually think computer science was worthy of being a degree. Uh, so I, I studied math and took computer science classes. And I had every expectation of coming back to work in the technology industry. And in fact, I worked in my summers at Hewlett Packard. It was hilarious, actually. Um, they had this room, it was called the Demo Center, and they brought in people who were famous, or not, not even famous, dignitaries of some kind to see the latest computers in my job. But I was basically Vanna White of the Demo Center. And so, and the computer's literally this size, right? And so I would be like, this is our new mini computer, right? Because this was what a mini computer was, this size. <laughs> it was hilarious. Anyways, um, I worked there and I really thought that I would go back after graduation. I had a job waiting for me. Um, but I also had started working on my college newspaper and actually just started because I needed money. So they were paying me to lay out the ads. And so I was laying out the ads and like back then you had to use PageMaker, which probably none of you remember, but it was a software program to like design a page and then you would print out the ad and then actually like put hot, cut it out with a razor and then put hot wax on it and place it on this like page that you would send to the printer. And I had like a little bit of an advantage because I knew how to use PageMaker 
And so I was able to get this job where I made, I think, three fifty dollars an hour. And after a year or two of laying out ads, I just was like really interested that everyone around me was talking about writing news articles. And I was like, I want to try that, right? Because those guys get the free pizza at the like editorial meetings. <laughs> and so I started trying it and I was like, oh, this, I could do this. And um, I would say that even then I had a realization which has kept with me all along, which was that I thought of a news article as a proof, right? I was a math person and I was like, oh, I get this. You have a thesis, you need to prove it. What's the evidence you need to prove that thesis? And, and so I always sort of saw it as similar. Now I understand that most people don't see that connection and not very many people use that analogy, but for me, it really made sense. And so when it came to graduation, I was like, oh, I could go back to technology, but like I didn't, my job was still Vanna White, you know, it wasn't that fun. And so I was like, I'll try journalism, just like my rebellious phase. <laughs> Right. And so I went um, to Washington, D.C., actually, and worked at a tiny little newswire service that doesn't exist anymore called States News Service. And you guys are going to laugh, but the point of States News Service was this is like the Internet was not yet like a commercial medium, um, was that all these newspapers around the country didn't know what their member of Congress was doing in Washington. And so they pooled their resources and would hire like one young reporter to be their person in DC. And so I was the reporter for the Colorado Springs Gazette Telegraph, the Pueblo Chieftain, and um, the Tucson Daily Star. And I basically ran around after their members of Congress and said like, why did you vote this way on this thing or that thing? And wrote little stories for these um, places. And then as I was working there, uh, the Netscape revolution happened. And, you know, Netscape came out, people realized the internet was big. And all of a sudden, my market value as a reporter was so high because people were like, oh, wait, you know how to use a computer? Oh, you actually can program one? Holy moly. And so I got hired at the San Francisco Chronicle and moved out there to write about these new tech companies, which was hilarious because the newsroom did not have personal computers. It had main dumb terminals connected to a mainframe. And so actually there was no way in the newsroom to connect to the internet. So I was writing about the internet, but I had to go home to my own personal computer in order to try to connect to it. And I remember having these fights with the Netscape press office because they were like, we only send our press releases by email. And I was like, I know, but I'm in a newsroom where we only have fax machines. So could you please send them a fax? And they would be like, no, we refuse to use fax machines. And so I would have to like beg and borrow from other reporters. I remember the Wall Street Journal San Francisco office had internet and I'd be like, can you guys share the press releases with me? Um, so anyways, I was writing about um, technology and that sort of, since then, I then I went to the, um, I came to Columbia actually for a journalism fellowship called the Night Badget where I got an MBA. Um, it's a fellowship for business journalists. So basically as a technology reporter, I was transformed into a business journalist, but um, very hilariously, um, they thought, you know, you know math, you must know business. But I remember I went to my editor and I was like, I'm looking at these Microsoft earnings and I just don't know, like there's one called income statement, one called balance sheet, like which one should I look at? And I remember her face went like completely white and she was like, um, you don't know anything about business? And I was like, no, just because there's numbers involved doesn't mean I actually know it, you know? Um, so she was like, you need to go to this program at Columbia. So I came to Columbia and learned, um, you know, accounting, finance, all that. And then when I graduated in January of 2000 was the peak of the dot-com bubble. And so the Wall Street Journal hired me literally just like, they were like, cover the internet. And I was like, any particular part? And they were like, nope, just everything, all of it. Because <laughs> at that time, it's hard to imagine now, but the newspaper industry, was, the, the newspaper could barely get enough um, news articles because they had so many ads because every one of those dot-com companies was buying these big ads and spending all of their venture money on ads to get investors and to get Wall Street to back them. And so it was basically kind of a weird news bubble at the same time. And so they were just like, they just needed copy, like just write articles because oftentimes we would find out on a Friday that like the next week's paper was gonna be twice as big and we needed twice as many articles. <laughs> um, sadly, that era, 
has ended. <laughs> and, and that's actually primarily because of tech, right? I mean, basically the only way you could reach like a Wall Street middle manager was to advertise in the Wall Street Journal. And it was a hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars for a full page ad. Now, of course, the rise of behavioral advertising means that if you want to find that guy, you don't need to buy an ad in the Wall Street Journal, right? You just go to one of these ad tracking companies and they follow him around on the internet and you can buy an ad to get that guy for so pennies, literally pennies, right? And also he's more likely to look at it. And I'm sorry, I'm being really gendered. Okay. There are lots of middle managers also who are women, but point is that that person is actually less likely to look at an ad in the in the Wall Street Journal because they're probably reading some really interesting article as they are on some website where they're like, why did I end up here again? And then they might see an ad that'd be more interesting than the content. And so the rise of this new advertising model really has destroyed the newspaper industry, as you may all know. Um, so basically, as a reporter um, at the Journal, I realized that this was happening, that the, new, the industry I was covering, technology, was changing. It was really about monetizing people's data. And I had grown up in a world where technology was about selling software, which was in a box shrink wrapped on a shelf. And I was like, oh my gosh, what does this have to do with like, what is this going to do to the world? And so this is where I actually realized that I could make an impact by including engineering in my investigations. So essentially what I did was I was like, I want to write about this world of people who track you across the internet and what is this all about? And I realized that I could use engineering to help me with that. And that was something that really had not happened in newsrooms. So there were people who were technologists in newsrooms, but essentially they were on the graphics desk, like building graphics, or they might be in the back end building the website, or they might be, uh, there was like a data analysis group where you would bring some basically Excel spreadsheets to some people and they would do some pivot tables for you. But there wasn't this idea about engineering being part of the reporting process. And I thought, well, look, I don't, actually know how to code anymore, right? Like the last time I programmed was in Lisp. So you may know that that was a long time ago. Um, but I knew what the capacity and the capabilities of engineering was. And so I found a grad student at UC Berkeley who had done a really interesting analysis at the information school. Um, he had done this analysis of sort of like how pervasive were Google's online ad tracking technologies. He did a scan, basically. And so I basically convinced my editors to hire him as a freelance, like to do a scrape for me. And then we did big stories. And then everyone was like, we want more of that. So I kept hiring him and kept hiring him. And by the way, he, Ashkan Sultani, is now the head of the California's new privacy regulatory agency. Um, so he has continued to focus on privacy and uh, is a real leader. Uh, so at any rate, um, I started to build this idea of journalism with engineering capacity. And the thing that was super cool about it was it supercharged our ability to get impact. And the reason I say that is I think that we're in an interesting time. There's a lot of policy challenges and obviously politics is insane right now and always has been, but particularly feels insane right now. But we are in a world where policy is informed by data. And basically data is the weapon that both sides need to have, right? So everyone comes armed with their report, their data versus your data, right? Like that's how policy battles play out. And so by adding data sets to my reporting, I was essentially giving the policymakers ammunition that they could use. And so more results happened from this reporting than would have happened without the data sets, right? And so we would put out a data set of like, here's all the hundreds of websites we scraped and how many trackers they had. Or we did an analysis of 200 apps. We're sending data to various um, third parties. And so the FTC or different agencies or attorney generals would look at this and they would say, oh, I'm going to bring a case because that violates our rules on deceptive advertising or what this or that. So I realized that adding data and adding this ability to build basically larger sample sizes was a real game changer for journalism. And I think that's because 
journalism, honestly, had been getting by with the three anecdotes, right? Like for a long time, that's what that's what a journalist could pretty much collect as a human, right? You find three people, you write a trend story, people are doing this, people are doing that. You know, I went to a diner, I interviewed six people, this is what's happening. And I think the public has lost faith in those small sample sizes. I think policymakers do not rely anymore on those small sample sizes. And so I think it's incumbent on journalism to increase their sample sizes. And essentially, the best way to do that is, you know, automation, right? That's what is that's what computers are great for. So I left the Wall Street Journal to go to ProPublica to bring that to another level. I thought, you know, ProPublica had a much bigger data team. It was like much more likely to be able to do great things. And what I found was that I could also supercharge my impact by doing more sophisticated statistical analysis. So we hadn't really done that at the journal. We were just collecting the data, writing about what we found. But at ProPublica, what happened between my move from Wall Street Journal to ProPublica was Snowden revelations came out. And I had been doing investigative series on privacy. Well, after Snowden, in the post-Snowden era, Basically, no one, everyone was like, yeah, I kind of get that my privacy has been violated. Like, I don't know. And I felt like I didn't have as much to bring to the table uh, with that, given that he had just revealed every single secret document <laughs> about surveillance. And so I thought, well, what is the next thing that I should be investigating? And I thought, I want to investigate how this data is used against people. And so I did, I uh, looked around and I was like, what is the most high stakes place that data is being used to investigate people and make decisions about them. And to my great surprise, I found that there was this tool in the criminal incarceration system. I do not call it criminal justice. Um, and it was being used to predict your future criminality. And it was widely used across the country. It still is to this day. It's called Compass. And I looked into it and I was like, oh my God, no one has done any independent analysis of this. It just, uh, jurisdictions like sheriff's office, police would use it across the country, still do. It's used in New York State, actually every single county except New York City. Um, and they would publish their own reports, like it works great. <laughs> and that would be the only independent validation. And I, and actually at that time, the attorney general, Eric Holder, had given a speech saying, I am concerned that these tools are perpetuating the known racial bias that we have in our system already, and somebody needs to do an investigation. In fact, he's called on the US Sentencing Commission to do an investigation. So I called them and I said, are you doing the investigation that Eric Holder asked you to do? And they were like, mm, we have a couple other things in line before that. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm gonna do it. So. I basically collected all this data from um, a Freedom of Information Act request in Florida, where I got the scores of 18,000 people who were assigned a score at the time that they were arrested. And that score was meant to predict, would they go on to commit a future crime in the next two years if they were released? And so once I had those scores, I was like, okay, let's see how accurate it is. So we have to spend a long time, I think it was six months of four people scraping all the records to see, did those people go on to get arrested, right? Like, let's check, was it true or not? And then if it was, and like, was it fair, right? Was it racially biased? And so what we found was that it was only 60% accurate. So eh, slightly more than a coin toss. Like I know for sure I would be fired from my job for being 60% accurate, um, but, it was, you know, marginally better than coin toss. But the 40% of the time that it was wrong, it was wrong in wildly different ways for black and white defendants. So the black defendants were basically twice as likely to be pr predicted to be a future criminal when they weren't. And the white defendants were twice as likely to be predicted to not be a future criminal when they weren't. And so essentially it was just biased in the way of thinking that black defendants were always gonna be criminal. And it was really unfair. And so we were only able to get to that analysis by talking to statisticians across the country who said, how do you sort this data? Because we hadn't had occurred to us that like, you know, there were many ways to slice the data. And the, the industry was using something called a Cox regression, which was this time series regression. And under that, you definitely got the 60% accuracy thing, but you didn't see the error rate disparity. And so we had to talk to a lot of people before we realized that you could 
parse out that disparity through a very simple technique called truth tables, which maybe some of you know. But this was when I started to realize that not only was collecting data the really important thing, but finding experts to help us analyze it and which techniques to apply. Because one thing that I didn't realize before doing all this, that statistics is an art, not a science, and because you could talk to 10 statisticians and they would all tell us a different thing to do. And I, I was like, wait a minute, I thought this was a field where there were answers. Turns out not so much. So you have to decide and make really coherent decisions about why you chose one technique over another. That story, machine bias, was probably the most impactful story I've ever done in my career because it, um, it was this huge data set that showed algorithmic bias that no one had ever been able to see before. And by the way, people had suspected it, predicted it for years. There were 10 years worth of 15 years worth of law papers saying, if you're going to use the kinds of questions that they ask in these, in these uh, questionnaires to determine your future criminality, you're going to have a racial bias. The questions are, of course, not about your race, but they're all these things that are proxies, right? Like, does anyone in your family ever been arrested? Have you live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of crime? Well, guess what? We know police over police in minority neighborhoods. And so then obviously you're going to get people in those neighborhoods who say yes to those questions, and then you're going to end up with a bias in the outcome. But the people who made these things were like, well, there's no race factor, right? So therefore it's fair. And then they didn't ever look to see if there was disparate outcomes. So we basically found that we had this proof and this data set that no one had ever had before. And the computer science field, as many all of you know, that there's now like a whole area called fairness and accountability that really our story, our machine bias was like one of the founding elements of that movement to try to put more fairness into the algorithms. But I will say that it has been quite sad because actually these algorithms continue to be used um, throughout the US and there has been some movements policy-wise to try to rein them in, but um, to this day, <laughs> they are still used and it is what, seven years later, six years later. so. Um, so sometimes, um, I don't want to be a bummer about impact, but one thing that I've had to teach myself as a journalist is that impact is, takes a long time. Sometimes, like I think that starting the conversation about that bias was incredibly important, but like how long will it take to play out uh, and have it change? I don't know. It certainly has changed the computer science field and the way people look at algorithms. And the criminal incarceration world is, um, there are a lot of issues with that area of the world. And like, honestly, people still believe this fallacy, which by the way, I heard repeated in the education seminar this morning that, uh, you know, computers are gonna be more fair than humans. And, you know, the reality is that there's no evidence for that to be true. And in fact, computers are just things made by humans to perpetuate their biases. So like, I can't, I still cannot really believe that that truism is out there. And I almost stood up in the presentation to argue with him, but I spared you all that. Um, <laughs> but I just, um, I think there are a lot of people who really think, look, judges are biased. And so we're going to use um, a computer. And look, I'm not saying judges aren't biased. They totally are, right? But like, you can argue with a judge, right? Like, you can say, I am not as bad as you think I am. But you can't say, I'm a seven, you think I'm a seven, I'm a three, right? Like that's what the argument is for this algorithm is a one through 10 scale of how risky you are in the future. You can't disprove it. There's no way to prove you won't be a risk in the future. Like how could you possibly do that? So, so basically in terms of impact, I think it's worth remembering that things take a long time, right? But the one thing that I'm really committed to is continuously incrementally improving my techniques as a watchdog. And so after ProPublica, I decided that I really wanted to build a newsroom around this exact type of work. And so I founded the, the Markup, which is a nonprofit newsroom that investigates the impact of technology and society. And we do a huge amount of algorithmic auditing. And so I put together a newsroom that had basically half engineers and half journalists, and they work in pairs. And so it's a really different concept than most newsrooms where the engineers are sort of over by in a service desk. And one thing that I think is really important, as you guys know, is like nobody wants to be a service desk. It's totally disempowering. And journalists in particular, because many of them are not so tech literate, would come to these engineering groups and say, get me data on this. And like it's ordering it like it's a hamburger. And it's not like that in no way. It's so hard 
collecting data is hard, cleaning data is insanely hard, analyzing it is really hard. And so I wanted the journalists to be in on it from the beginning together as partners. And we've done some really amazing investigations. I'm gonna mention a few of them. Um, we built, um, I think this, uh, my colleague Leon was here last year. I don't know if anyone of you saw him, but he was talking about an investigation he, we did of Google search results. So Google, um, you know, shows you things you want to find on the web, or so they say they do. Um, but what you notice anecdotally when you look at a Google search result page is that more and more of it is taken up with like those little boxes, like answers and things you might be looking for and like, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes pretty far down. And what you may not realize about all of that is those are all just leading you back to Google's products, right? So th that way they get more traffic, they get more eyeballs, they get more ad revenue. And so it's actually pretty far down the page that you get to the first website that is not a Google property. So we thought, let's measure that. How far down the website do you have to go to, to get to that? And so we scraped thousands of searches and then Leon came up. Leon, who was a data scientist, never been in the newsroom. I hired him to be in the newsroom and like, you know, bring his techniques to journalism. So he had this idea like uh, in biology, we do staining. So we would stain something to see where it goes. Um, and so he was like, I'm gonna stain parts of the page like and by classification. So classify Google product, add, independent. And he could see the colors and see that basically at the top of the page, 40% of it was um, Google taking up for itself. And above the fold, meaning that before you have to go to the next page would be next page on your mobile phone, um, it was 60%. So essentially they're taking up a huge portion of that real estate. And the thing is that people have been screaming about this, right? People who work in, whose lives depend on search results, which would be all people, um, have been saying forever, I can't get to the top, Google does it for themselves. I mean, Yelp has been suing Google for years over this. And yet there wasn't a quantification of it, right? And so once again, this is where I feel like journalism can bring bigger sample sizes. Like we were like, okay, a million people have written this story, but we need to bring the number. And what's great about it is bringing that number really helped. Like all of the antitrust cases now against Google cited. And so none of those have gone, we don't know where they're all gonna go, but like certainly it is now part of the case against Google for what's called self-preferencing. Um, there's a bill in Congress that would eliminate the platform's ability to self-preference. Um, there was some hope about passing this summer. It appears that that hope is probably dying, but, um, but it is the one bill that is actually the most bipartisan support because everybody kind of agrees that like, you can't just, you know, do you use your platform? If you're both a participant and the marketplace, you have to provide some fair rules for the other participants so that you're not advantaging yourself. That investigation was so successful that we did another one for Amazon. We wanted to see why they're preferencing their own brands because the thing about Amazon is you can't actually tell because they have all these weird names for all their different brands and they don't always label them. It took us actually months to figure out what their brands were. We had to look through all these trademark files and you know use some undocumented APIs we found on their site and we eventually came up with a list. This is also Leon's work. And then we did an analysis, but it was interesting because that one, it was hard to do um, a real estate analysis, like how much of the page, because I don't, you, I'm sure you've seen Amazon search results, they're like a grid. And so it was like, you could measure it that way, but we decided to just focus on that top slot. What, what's the one that comes up first? And so then we were like, well, how do you do that? So this is where it's really funny because traditionally as a journalist, I've been more of a critique of prediction models, right? My, you know, the whole idea of the machine bias story was that this prediction model was A, inaccurate, and B, biased. But in this case, using a prediction model was actually the best way we could analyze the data. So what we did was we said, well, what's the most predictive factor for getting the top slot? And the most predictive factor was being an Amazon brand. And it was eight to one versus the next most predictive factor. So it was so clear that um, that was going to be the most, um, that was the most compelling argument that we could make. And I was really nervous. I thought, you know, I don't know, are lawmakers going to be into a predictive model as evidence, right? Like the one about Google was very clear. It was like, it was just real, they're taking up this much of the page, very clear. 
And so I was, I was wondering, will this have impact? Well, it certainly did. So the House Antitrust Committee so had been investigating all of the tech companies, and they had been for two years asking Amazon on the record, do you give preference to your own brands? And they had said on the record, no, we do not. And so when our thing came out, uh, they said, please explain. And then they didn't share what the explanation was that Amazon gave, but what they did do after getting that explanation was they referred the case to the DOJ for a perjury charge. So they are currently being investigated for perjury because the evidence was strong enough that the House Antitrust Committee was like, I think these guys are lying to Congress. So that is the kind of impact that I'm looking for as a journalist. I want to influence the debate so that it is based on facts, right? I'm not trying to influence the debate as policy. Like, I don't have a policy outcome. I don't actually know if that self-preferencing bill is the most optimal way to address this. But what I do know is that we need to be talking about the facts when we make those decisions. And so the more data that we can bring to the table, the better. And so that has been sort of my life's work is trying to bring more data with better analysis to the public so that better decisions can be made. And I really need to stop talking because I want to open it for questions. So thank you for listening. Questions? You want to... Sorry, what? Uh, so the the project, the research project with Trump is why why is it taking so long to make a change? Why wouldn't like if, if the research is out? Why wouldn't you take it to the company and tell them maybe the the findings that we have? Why can't we change the algorithm that we use? Um, we definitely did bring it to the company. So the one of the things that I do all the time with my investigations and is just an important principle in journalism is you always have to go to the person you're writing about and give them a chance to respond before you publish. So we gave them our entire analysis and gave them, I think, at least a month, if not two months, to look at it. And their argument was that, um, okay, their argument, if I, I think this is fair, is that the error rates don't matter, right? The bias in the error rates doesn't matter. We're optimizing for the accuracy rate. And if you change that, we might change the accuracy rate. And so, I mean, to me, when you're optimizing for a 60% accuracy rate, I'm like, I'm not even sure what you're optimizing for, but it was basically an op algorithmic optimization argument. And they've made that argument. Um, I think that is the reason though that it hasn't changed, I think is actually just that the political reason that these algorithms exist is actually, a good one in a weird way. So basically, people wanted to find a way to let people out. <laughs> we have too many people in our prisons, right, in our jails. And so these tools were developed by reformers who were like, we need to find basically scientific cover to tell the public we're letting out people who are safe. And so I think that unfortunately, that political reality still exists, right, which is like, you want to be, they want to be able to say, we have science behind who we're letting out. And so I, that political reality has sort of, I think, overridden the fact that we are, we've decided that the only people who are safe are white people, right? So that's depressing, but also was true before. Hi, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, I was just wondering how in the markup, what is the process for finding new story ideas? And once you've done that, what's the process for finding the data for that story? That's a great question. So basically, um, I think that uh, journalism can learn a lot from the scientific method. And so I've asked people in the newsroom to come up with, I developed a little thing called um, the investigative checklist, which is what is your hypothesis? What are you trying to test? Is it a testable hypothesis? And then what data would you need to test that hypothesis? How can we get it? And so it forces people to go through that method of thinking of it in terms of 
uh, the scientific method, as opposed to just like, I want to look at whatever, right? Because then whenever you do the, I want to look at whatever, which is always tempting, and I love those kind of things, but you end up just um, swimming around. You know, you this is where you end up with those weird big data things where like people who like mayonnaise also like French fries. Like, you know, this is not that helpful, right? Like these are really interesting correlations you can find in data, but they're not, you, I think you have to know what you want before you start an analysis. And I, and I think that almost every case, the data doesn't exist, right? One story we did on mortgage approval algorithms, um, looking at racial bias in those algorithms, um, there was a data set. The, there was a new law that had required more the banks to release more information about um, who they were approving for mortgages than others. And we were able to use that, match it with census data, make some just, um, analysis by race and show that the algorithms were, sadly, uh, really racially polarized. So an, an applicant, a black applicant, a white applicant of the exact same financial standing, right? The black applicant we rejected like far more often than the white applicant. And so um, sometimes there's an existing data set where we can supplement it, but many times we have to go and collect the data ourselves. But I think it's just important to remember what you, coming up with the hypothesis first is the most important thing in my opinion. Hello. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, what roles do like ethics, um, like you know, ethical perspectives really play in your discoveries and how you approach um, matters? Like, um, say you um, uphold a utilitarian perspective on how things should be, and then you perhaps have someone that upholds some some egalitarian, like how do you kind of merge those into factual points? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, there might be some kind of difficult line. Yeah, I mean, this is a debate that has been raging in journalism for a very long time. And it used to be when I was coming up in the field that everyone was uh, interested in objectivity. Are you objective? Is your reporting objective? And what that ended up fostering was this whole idea of false equivalence. So, you know, that there's like actually two sides to every story. And so, you know, the most egregious example is climate change, right? Like 99.9% .9 of scientists think like it's happening and 0.1% say it might not be. And people would give equal weight to that. And that I think journalism in general as a field has been moving away from that idea of objectivity. But it is hard because we all are human, we all have biases, and we have to understand how to acknowledge those. And so my feeling is that you just have to acknowledge your biases and um, and still make sure that your work sort of stands on its own. I mean, that's why doing the data sets is better. I think it, 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 like, it doesn't really matter what my views are about, you know, criminal risk assessments, because I just, I made the data, it says what it says. And so it, I think it takes, the whole purpose of putting out all those data sets is to take some of the burden off of the individual and like, are they trustworthy? And say, is the data trustworthy? Is their analysis trustworthy? And like, what happens for us is we get our analyses um, kind of peer reviewed before publication. So sending them out to experts. And then after publication, oftentimes people rerun the data to make sure we were right or come up with different analyses. And so in some ways we're basically offering it to the public to say, stress test it yourself. You know? Hello. Uh, thank you for your talk. So um, you mentioned how like um, your background in engineering and math sort of shaped how you approach tech journalism. But I was wondering if there was like some key things that you learned with, when you were working in journalism that shaped how you approached engineering problems? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, honestly, my biggest finding is the thing I, says, I said just now, which is like, I really, really believe that you have to know what the question is before you go out and figure out what data you want to look at. It's so tempting 
Um, so many data journalists and engineers I know are so tempted by existing data sets because, of course, it's so delightful. You just take it, you do some little loo -de loo make a little graph, you know, it's super fun. And that's fine. But, like, it's worth just remembering data is political, right? Why does America not collect data on police violence? I don't know, but they don't, right? And the reason is because there's no political institution that wants to have that data. So the Washington Post had to do its own database. And I think the most important questions of our time are ones where there are big institutions that don't want that data out there. And so we have to collect it. If you just live off of existing data sets, you're basically accepting that the people with power and money get to control what the narrative is because they come up with the data, then that's what the narrative is. So I think it's incumbent on journalists as watchdogs to come up with their own data. And that is something that has really informed my view of engineering. And I yell at my husband all the time, like, you know, don't take that existing data set, go collect one. He's like, you're tripling my costs. And I'm like, yes, that's also it's very expensive. <laughs> Hi, thank you um, for your amazing talk. Um, I guess this is a more personal question. Have you ever at one point in your career feel like that that's just too long of a cycle for your um, papers and for journalism more to take effect in the world that you want to be on the other side of the world? Like, like you grew up in the Silicon Valley, have you ever thought about going back and make changes in the tech industry? Yeah, I get asked that sometimes. I, I don't know why, but I am not tempted <laughs> ever to go back. Um, I uh, I just think it's so fun doing what I do. And I also get to focus on what are the biggest questions that I think are out there. And so um, I really... Um, I really haven't been tempted. I will say this though, right now my uh, thinking is evolving a little bit, which is that I think for a long time, um, I was early on very much alone in sort of like saying like, hey, I think there's some things we need to worry about with tech and then like, here's some of the issues and, and, and that. And I think that in some ways I have been successful, me and many others. And so there's like slightly less urgency around showing the problems and sort of a little bit more about like what are the solutions and so that's something that is is weird for me as a journalist because i um i see myself as you know much more about like oh just revealing problems but in my weekly newsletter that um aaron was so kind to tout um i have been leaning into a little bit more like exploring solutions like what are the ideas that might work out there because i do think what's super cool right now is that we, this issues bipartisan, right? There isn't actually a, like a right and a left agenda around tech policy. And so I think this is a really interesting time to start exploring solutions. So I can still do that from my stance as a journalist, but it is something that is interesting to me that I'm sort of evolving towards. I love how many questions there are. Hello. Uh, with the prevalence and impact of misinformation, especially in recent years, do you feel like that's changed how you report and how you tell stories? Yeah, the rise of misinformation is a real crime for everybody, right? I mean, it just, it makes um, our information atmosphere really polluted, right? And I think of it as like an environmental problem. You know, we had really bad pollution in the 60s and um, the rivers were catching fire all the time. And we as a nation like came together to, to fix it. And we did a bunch of different things. Like we had the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, which were very strict emission limits. Like you just can't admit pollution. We changed our own behavior. We started recycling, we started picking up dog poop. Um, and then we did a lot of transparency measures like like the uh, listing who were the most toxic, uh, you know, releasers and shaming companies who released more. Um, and so I think that we would have to do something similar, like a multi-layered approach to the information environment um, is probably necessary. And I think from the perspective of journalism, it's really hard, right? We have been financially devastated as an industry um, by the loss of ad revenue. So we're, I think we were a $30 billion industry. Now it's 10, right? That's a huge fall in 20 years. Um, and then in our tiny little space, fight, trying to fight for anyone to notice our stuff and there's all sorts of lies, it's a terrible situation. Um, 
I don't know that I have any particular <laughs> solution. I would say that like what's happening in Europe is really interesting. They have um, basically passed some laws to say like, the tech platforms are sort of accountable for how much of this misinformation is on there. And they're also working on some laws to bolster and funding for journalism. So they're kind of trying to squash it a little bit, lift up on the other side. I think that that is kind of what's needed. That's not, um, that's not happening here. If we have time for one final question, I'm gonna go on to this one. So earlier you were talking about how when you learned about Compass and its other practices, you are kind of surprised that no one had really done an independent investigation into it before. Um, and from the talk, it sounds like, you know, we're doing better in terms of investigating tech. Uh, but my question is, do you think it's enough? Like, do you think there might still be some subtle problems that are flying under the radar? And if we're not doing enough, then how can we incentivize it more? Um, we're definitely not doing enough. Um, I, I think, um, like, you know, the markup is this tiny little newsroom. We do a couple things a year, big things like the Google or the Amazon um, analysis. I would like to see way more of this. I mean, it's one thing that I have often said is that like, it's sort of like um, if there wasn't an FAA, right? And planes just like, you just built them and then you flew them and who knows if they fall out of the sky, they fall out of the sky. That's sort of where we are now with tech, right? Like basically, the companies put out whatever they want, and then, oh, there's a genocide in Myanmar. Oops, sorry, screwed up, right? Like, we'll try to be better next time. And I think, like, I see, like, teams, like the one I built at the markup, as, like, people running out onto the tarmac trying to inspect the plane, right? Like, before it takes off. And that's not a really workable model, right? Like, there needs to be um, a government body that says, hey, you know, uh, your your algorithms need to be safe before the, you employ them on the public. And one thing about the European rules is, for instance, they are requiring risk assessments for the algorithms. So the companies need to show that they're like, you know, how they like how Facebook decides what news goes to the top, whatever isn't discriminatory, isn't harmful to youth, doesn't um, have you know other. They have, I think there's several things they have to assess and they have to come up with a report and say, this is why our algorithms are safe. And that's the beginning, I think, because it just doesn't, I mean, I think there needs to be so much more analysis. And I think it has to be from all parts of society, right? Journalists have a role to play, but government has much more power. They can demand information from the companies and they should also play a role. And so I think there needs to be um, a whole new field around this, and there is. I mean, algorithmic auditing is now becoming a field, and I'm really thrilled about that, and I think it's amazing work, but it needs to be done, you know, massively more. Thank you.